Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I'd like to thank, thank Vice Chair Greenwald for chairing the meeting last month in my absence. Appreciate that. I call to order the February 27th, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting, and it is 1.30. Thanks for being on time, everybody. This is an in-person live stream meeting format, and members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. For those attending online, please make sure that you have typed your name that reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on any agenda item for those attending online. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box, and you can use the raise hand feature to ask questions at any time on the agenda. Reminder, during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comment. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, make sure that your light is on, the microphone is on. When you're prepared to speak, please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Right now, the sign-in sheet is going around, so please sign in. At this time, we'll ask the TAC members and alternates in person to introduce themselves. And we'll go around the room, starting with Kent. Kent Mormon, Adams County City of Thornton. Jessica Michelbust, Colorado Department of Transportation, Region 1 Director. David Gaspers, City and County of Denver. Bill Saroy, RTD. Alex Hydright, Boulder County. Rachel Holt Team, Bicycle Colorado. Art Griffith, Douglas County. Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Interest. Marissa Gahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Uh, Jim Euston, CDOT Region 4. Long Wynn, Adams County. On Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog. Sarah Grant, City and Canyon Broomfield. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog. And Lisa Nguyen just walked in. Bill Greenwald, uh, City of Longmont, Boulder County. Deborah Basket, City of Westminster for Jefferson County. Uh, Justin Schmidt, City of Lone Tree, also representing Douglas County. Brian Weimer, Arapahoe County. And Jeff Dankenburn, representing Arapahoe County from City of Centennial. Chris Hudson, Douglas County, Town of Parker. Kevin Ash, Weld County, Town of Frederick. Hillary Simmons, a little help, Senior Special Interest. Hey, thank you very much. At this time, I'll hand it over to Jacob for a few announcements before we start. Thank you, Madam Chair. So a couple things. Uh, first of all, you may have noticed something looks just a little bit different in the room today. The reason for that is because if you'll recall last fall, we were working on revisions to our Dr. Cog uh, committee guidelines, including the guidelines uh, for our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, those are actually expected to come to the Dr. Cog board in March. Um, you all gave approval last fall, I think last December. Um, you'll recall that once the board approves the updated committee guidelines, it will add 10 members to TAC. So we started to think ahead and think about what the seating arrangement will look like when we have 10 new folks in the room. So we wanted to try this out with a smaller membership and just see how it feels. Um, so we would be interested in your feedback. You can maybe at the end of the meeting or just afterwards, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> but we wanted to try it out today. And then the other announcement for me is we do have one new alternate, Jordan Rudel uh, from CDOT Region 1 is the new, uh, new alternate for CDOT Region 1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We'll now open up the meeting for public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes. And as a reminder, after public comment period, only uh, Transportation Advisory Committee members and alternates will be able to partake in discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which we'll wrap up, and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everybody, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to speak on each agenda item. Do we have any public comment, either in person or online? Okay. Thank you, Mr. 
uh, Madam Chair. I'll give it a second, but I currently don't see any hands raised at this time. Thank you, Cam. Um, so we will start the agenda with a meeting summary of January 2023 TAC meeting summary. Um, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions? Thank you. Seeing none, the meeting summary will stand. Thank you. We'll be moving on to our first uh, action item today. That will be action item uh, number item number four, policies for fiscal year 24 to 27 TIP set-aside programs. This is attachment B in your packet. I'll hand it over to Josh Schwenk. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as we're discussing uh, set-asides to our transportation improvement program, it might be helpful to start with what is a set-aside. Uh, so you may have seen this graphic before, we use it quite a bit, but this is really our planning framework for our transportation planning here at Dr. Cog. Everything really goes back to MetroVision, which is kind of our broad, long-range, uh, multidisciplinary plan for the region. Taking from that uh, the transportation-specific elements, those uh, become our long-range MetroVision regional transportation plan. Our current one is the 2050 RTP. Obviously, within that, we have the fiscally constrained uh, project list of what we believe we can afford to uh, build within that time frame. And then within that, or below that, uh, we have our transportation improvement program. That's really that short-term program of projects over four years where we're actually dedicating funding towards projects to accomplish that vision within the RTP and Metro vision. Within the TIP, we have a further subcategory, which are our set-aside programs. So for those of you familiar with our call for projects program, uh, programs, generally uh, we hold a call for projects with the funding that's distributed to our region that's broken out into a regional and sub-regional share. Projects are selected and are ultimately approved by the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. The set aside programs are a little bit different in that that funding is removed off the top prior to the call for projects. And as the name implies, it's set aside for particular programs of a regional interest. Um, the amount of funding and the specific topics of those programs are set in the TIP policy that's approved by the board uh, as part of each TIP. Ultimately, some of those set aside programs do hold their own calls for projects, at which case all of those project selections would be approved by the Dr. Cog board as well. So our current uh, Portfolio of set-aside programs is a little bit confusing uh, if you see this graphic, but there are ultimately five programs identified in the TIP policy. One of those is split into uh, three subcategories, and one of those subcategories is further divided into two tracks. Uh, there are essentially eight uh, set-aside programs. Um, so we have our Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, or RTO and T set-aside, really funding signal upgrades, uh, fiber, ITS, things like that throughout the region. Our air quality improvement set aside is a little bit uh, different from the others. Uh, that is funding distributed directly to the Regional Air Quality Council for their programs. Skipping a little bit, we have our Human Services Transportation, or HST set aside, uh, that funds transit options for vulnerable groups, specifically uh, older adults, people with disabilities. You'll hear more about that on our next agenda item. Um, and our transportation demand management or TDM set aside, where funding is really going to go to programs that encourage uh, commuting options that are not single occupancy vehicles. Those are kind of our traditional set asides that we've had in the previous tips. We do have some new ones. Uh, so the four new ones we're grouping under the name Corridor Community Livability and Innovative Planning, or CLIP for short, uh, because those are kind of the four spe specific programs within it. Uh, so that would be transportation corridor planning. We are currently piloting that. Many of you probably saw that, uh, where we're looking at corridor plans, kind of Dr. Cog-led corridor plans on major corridors throughout the region. Community-based transportation planning, we are also currently piloting that, uh, really looking at coordinating with community-based organizations on uh, transportation plans that center marginalized communities. Livable centers, small area planning uh, is really looking at urban centers, station areas, other nodes that are important to their communities and looking at the interplay between land use and transportation in those areas. And then innovative mobility, we'll look at uh, innovative solutions, new and emerging technology uh, for mobility in the region. 
So those are the current set-asides. Um, previously, our process was that each set-aside manager for each individual program would bring a policy guideline document to you all, the RTC, and the board uh, each time they would hold a call for projects. Um, there was nothing wrong with this program or this process, uh, but it led to a little bit of a disjointed process between all of our programs. Uh, occasionally some inconsistent information was available. And when we were in a period when there was not an open call for projects, having that information available for that program was not always the easiest to access. So what we're bringing before you today is a consolidated document uh, that would be a policy for all of our set-aside programs, bringing together information on each one in one place. Uh, we think this will be helpful both for internal staff um, as well as for all of you and for any project applicants throughout the region so that they have one reference point uh, to look for the policies specific to each of our set-aside programs. Uh, as part of this, we've also worked to slightly standardize uh, the application processes across the set-asides, understanding their different programs, different processes will be needed, but bringing in a little bit of consistency. Um, and also having this standing policy can help to streamline those calls for projects that they won't need to bring a policy document to you all each time a call for projects happens. Uh, they will be able to use this standing policy unless there are changes that will need an amendment brought before you all. So I won't run through each of these, but this just gives you an idea of the topics included for each of the programs within this document, uh, really ensuring that there's kind of standard information available for all of the programs. Uh, it's a standard structure, so if someone is interested in multiple programs, they can look at just one or look at multiple and they'll understand where to find information within each set-aside program section. Um, just a few of our benefits that we were striving for when putting together this document uh, was to have a separate section for each of the set-aside programs. You don't have to read all, I forget how many pages it is, but it's, it's a hefty document. Um, you can skip to those pages specific to your uh, set-aside that you're interested in. All the information you need should be self-contained within that section. Um, like I mentioned, there's a standardized structure, so you can easily navigate to the information you're interested in. Um, bringing together a little bit of a standardized application process. As I mentioned in the past, uh, several of our set-asides used a two-step process where applicants would first submit a letter of intent, uh, would meet with Dr. Cog's staff to discuss that letter, and then based on those discussions could move forward with an application. Um, there was a strong interest amongst all of our programs in making that a standard process throughout all of our set-asides. Um, and then, as I mentioned, if any amendments are needed, if there are any changes to these policies prior to any call for projects, of course, that will come through TAC, RTC, and the board. So there will be that opportunity for additional review of any changes prior to the opening of a call for projects. So this is a very high level draft schedule, but in the past we've, we've essentially operated without a schedule for most of our set-asides. Um, it kind of relied on the knowledge of the set-aside managers on when those would happen. So this just gives kind of six month increments um, of when we expect a call for projects to occur and when we would expect those project selections to be approved uh, across all of our set-asides. So it gives at least a, uh, high level overview so that applicants can anticipate when calls might be opening and can plan accordingly. So happy to take any questions there might be on the policy document. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you, um, but happy to take any questions now, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Schwang. Do we have any questions from the TAC? Ms. Holtein. Thank you. Um, so I'm just I, generally curious how the scoring was developed because uh, there's some inconsistencies a little bit that I'm noticing in the scoring across the different programs. And in particular, I'm looking at the new broad category, which has a great new acronym with a season at the community corridor, something, something. 
Um, so I'm, I'm curious because when I was looking in there, I was specifically looking at the scoring for equity in uh, disadvantaged communities, and it ranges anywhere from like 10% to 25%. And I'm curious why there's such a big range in terms of how that specific element is scored across the different um, sub programs within that. So just as in the past, um, each of our individual set-aside programs uh, works to develop their own scoring criteria that they believe is uh, specifically tailored to their program. So those scoring elements do differ between the programs. Uh, we did work uh, with set-aside sponsors to try to ensure that there were some references back to MetroVision uh, objectives as well as the MVRTP priorities, um, as well as some things like ensuring equity was accounted for in scoring. Um, but we didn't go into that level of detail in terms of the weight uh, given to each one. That was really up to each set-aside to develop. I will say with the new set-asides, um, all of the, the CLIP uh, set-asides, um, there may be amendments brought forward as those are sort of coming together. Um, those are new programs, and we're attempting a new approach uh, with several of them where it would be kind of Dr. Cog-led, similar to what we are doing with the pilot programs for the corridor and community-based uh, transportation planning. Uh, so it is very possible that there could be additional uh, refinement to some of these uh, criteria in the future as, as those programs come together a little bit more. Great, thanks for the explanation. I guess uh, my request would be as those are revisited that the transportation corridor planning, which has the lowest at 10%, um, at, at least is brought in line with the others at 15%. First, I'd love to see all of them closer to 20 or 25. Thank you. We'll definitely raise that with the set aside managers. Uh, Ms. Basket? Questions? I'm, I'm going to make the motion. So, uh, when I read this, uh, this item, I thought, what a logical thing to do. <laughs> So I want to commend the Dr. Kozlov. I feel like this is one step of a number that you've taken in the past six to nine months to clean up some processes for us that will ultimately make things. So I will move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee adoption of the policies for fiscal year 24 through 27 TIP set-aside programs. Thank you, Ms. Basket. Do we have a second? Mr. Mormon? Second. Any further discussion? Yes, go ahead. So my question is, I like the schedule, and I think that's a great thing to have for staff. Is it possible to be a little more granular, um, i.e. a parentheses as to six-month period is pretty long, but is it possible to say, hey, the call is going to be in June or July or whatever it is, and include that here? Because that would be helpful from a manpower resource allocation at the local level. I'll see um, what level of detail is available. I know as we're looking across sort of the entire four-year span, some of that is uh, a bit in flux um, in terms of exactly what month we'd be looking at. That's why we tried to stick to kind of the six-month periods that just kind of give that broad period. I will say we definitely will be posting specific dates to our website, sending that out through all of our channels, making those announcements to these groups as those uh, programs are approaching and as we have more specific dates uh, that are firmed up. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can get much more specific in this document just to avoid kind of bringing constant amendments back to you all when those change, but we'll definitely be sending that information out through all of our channels as much as possible as soon as we know those specific dates. And Chair, all right, can I just augment that? Exactly what Josh said, Brian, and I think you raise a good point, but just like Josh said, I think we're trying to strike the right balance. We don't want to get so detailed in this document that we're adjusting this document every month as specific change, but our commitment to you will be, we'll work, we'll work really hard so that on a quarterly basis or semi-annually, we're publishing a more detailed schedule for maybe the upcoming six months so that folks know sort of what's what's coming up in a more in a timeline. So appreciate that. Yes, and can you please state your name? I'm sorry, I can't read it from here. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm Mike Silverstein with the Regional Quality Council. And um, although I support the uh, the, uh, the framework here and, and I excellent approach, I just wanted to register that I need to abstain from the our Quality Council is called out. And yes, I'd like to vote for myself, but I shouldn't. Like just maybe just a point of clarification. I don't think you need to abstain. This is not a decision to allocate funds to the RAC. This is just the process for how funds will be allocated, kind of the process for allocating TIP set-aside programs. The funding allocation essentially has already been established by the board through adoption of the TIP policy itself. So that so you're not actually voting on an allocation of funding to the RAC. But I appreciate that caution. Sure. If 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 that's acceptable to I I the rest of the committee then then, then I can, I could then. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Um, do we have another comment, Mr. Hydrate? Thank you, um, Alex Hydrate, Boulder County. Um, I was wondering if I could propose a small, friendly amendment to include priority control systems and infrastructure for transit vehicles at signalized intersections to the list of illustrative projects in the regional traffic. Or, Regional transportation operations and technology uh, set aside. I think those are already included as eligible projects because later it mentions that if your project includes that in the scope, it could be eligible for 100% federal share, but it's not actually included in the earlier list of eligible project types. And I'll maybe defer to Greg, who I see in the back of the room, and Steve is giving a thumbs up. Um, I also just want to clarify those are it is an illustrative list so additional project types that aren't specifically called out um, could be eligible but yeah we'll we'll work to get that added um, yeah so we we have a we have a motion and we have a second all in favor wait, 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 oh wait oh sorry okay uh, sorry do you accept the, the friendly accept amendment? The amendment okay Thank you, Ms. Basket. And I also accept it. Thank you, Mr. Mormon. Okay, so we have a motion and second with an amendment as proposed by Mr. Hyde-Wright. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstentions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Move on to the next item, number five. This will be the transit super call project funding for July 2023, June 2024, through June 24, attachment number C, uh, Travis Noon, program manager, and AAA grant compliance. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Travis Noon here, program manager for AAA grant compliance. Uh, appreciate your time today. Presenting the project funding for July 2023 through June 2024 HST and 5310 programs. Uh, as a reminder, Dr. Cog does release a combined call for projects for the HST set aside. It's not working too well. Sorry. Is that better? Cool. All right. Uh, so we do release a combined call for projects for the HST set aside, uh, doc, the FTA 5310 funding, and the Older Americans Act and state funding for senior services funds for transit projects. Uh, the call that we released to the projects are intended to be implemented between July 1, 2023 and June 30th, 2024. Uh, there was approximately $8 million available for this call uh, throughout the three funding streams. Uh, we received proposals from 16 organizations requesting nearly $11 million for transit, capital, operating, and mobility management projects throughout the region. Uh, Dr. Cog does convene an independent review panel to score these projects, um, and I do the re their recommendations are included in your agenda packet. Um, I do want to call out a few things that are in those recommendations. Uh, so there is a recommendation to award Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging uh, $900,000 in HST funding for its Choice Services Voucher Program. Uh, there were a couple projects that weren't, out, weren't funded. Uh, that included a project from the City of Golden uh, for their, uh, they proposed a Flex Ride Voucher Program uh, that project really wasn't funded mostly because of the size of the request, which was $6,000. Um, that we do have a recommended minimum of $25,000, uh, unless there's a strong justification there. And that size of an award is really what ended up not having that project funded. Uh, 
the other projects that weren't funded were VIA's capital requests. Uh, and those, the, the money was allocated to VIA really based on their priorities in their project and the funding that was available. Um, and so all of the money that they were awarded was for operating mobility management, which was their first priority. Uh, just a reminder here that we do have the full picture, including the Older Americans Act awards in your packet, uh, but PAC, RTC are approving the HST and 5310 awards. Uh, the Older Americans Act awards will go through uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging and the Board of Directors for approval. Uh, with that being said, uh, the recommended motion is here on the screen for you all, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Noon. Do we have any questions from the TAC? Okay, seeing no questions. Uh, any additional thoughts or comments? Uh, do we have a motion? Mr. Weimer? Yes, I move to recommend to the RTC approval of the HST and FTA 5310 projects for July 2023, June 2024, as recommended by the peer review panel, including staff recommended carryover. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Yes, Mr. Gaspers. Uh, Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> yep, I'll second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Hi. Hi. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I just have to abstain. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> any any additional questions, comments? Okay. Um, so, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And um, abstain. All right. I abstain Thank you as well. So, uh, Frank Bruno is abstaining, and Hillary Simmons. And Hillary Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be moving on to uh, informational items. Uh, first informational briefing will be item six, 2023 raise grant request. This is attachment D, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. I'll do that from here if you don't mind. Um, so you'll recall that uh, a NOFO was released um, uh, last year for the latest round of federal raise grants, the discretionary grant program. Uh, that, that application period closes tomorrow. So for those of you applying for grants, I hope you've either submitted or are submitting very soon. Uh, we, did, we did put out a request to uh, our partners and member governments that if you were contemplating applying for a raise grant, just for transparency, share some basic information about your potential projects so that we could share that out with the region so that there's general awareness and opportunity for potential for collaboration or support if there are other folks that are interested, but really just so we're all well aware of sort of what's being pursued across the region and an opportunity for Dr. Cog staff to evaluate applications to make sure that they're consistent with our regional transportation plan, uh, don't trigger a regional transportation plan amendment in case you're asking for a support letter from Dr. Cog from the region for your project. So we did receive uh, Six, thank you, six, uh, six forms. Uh, we were able to include four of them in the packet. Two came in just a hair uh, late, so we, we, did get those, we did get those out. Um, I'm not gonna go through each one. They were, they were distributed to you. I think if you have any questions of each other, of sponsors for those projects, I'd say you have an opportunity to do that. Again, we're bringing this for information just for transparency so everyone uh, is aware. There's no approval requested. The region's not in the business of sort of approving what individual jurisdictions um, are doing. We think it's just really important for these federal discretionary grant programs for folks to be aware of what people are pursuing. Thank you, Mr. Papsdorf. Any questions or comments for Mr. Papsdorf? Mr. Weimer? So I just became aware of a project that a metro district is pursuing. So how does that play into this discussion? Yeah, good question, good question Brian. Um, again, not a requirement. We can't require that. We're not in the business of saying we need to approve folks applying for federal discretionary grant applications. We would hope that folks would recognize the value of sharing with regional partners about what they're, what they're doing. 
I think in that case, if they came to Dr. Cog and asked for a regional support letter for application, I think we would kindly decline um, and politely decline and say, you know, we, we appreciate that, but we really need to be more transparent with all of our partners. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to all of you uh, for folks to sort of play kind of play off on the side, decide they want to do something unilaterally, ask us for regional support when there's not broad regional awareness that those grant funds are being pursued. Um, I also wanted to add that the four that were received um, by the time the, mac the packet was pulled out was in, in your packet and then they're in the agenda as well in the back or online at drcog.org uh, slash calendar. Any additional uh, comments or questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll be moving on to item number seven of the informational briefing, taking action on regional vision zero action plan 2023 update. Uh, Emily Kleinfelter. Test. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's been a while since you've all seen me here. My name is Emily Kleinfelter, and I'm Dr. Cog Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner. Um, today, I'm going to give you guys a little briefing about the uh, strategic implementation plan update that we will be doing to taking action on Regional Vision Zero, which is the Regional Vision Zero Plan. Lots of big words that you just said. Um, okay, so why are we doing this? Is First, I want to just kind of start with this visual here. Um, this is a map taken from the federal uh, DOT and it is a uh, fatality concentration level by county from 2016 to 2020. So obviously not the most current, but still gets at the fact that um, we're not looking great here. I mean, you can see that we're high or above average for most of the region. Um, so again, moving on to why is this what we're wanting to take on right now? Well, for one, progress is stalled. We're not moving in the right direction um, with our fatalities and serious injury numbers. Those are continuing to increase. And, you know, that's not just numbers. Those are people's lives. Those are loved ones, someone's brother, sister, mother, friend. And so it's really important for us to, to very much take this seriously and care about it. Um, there's also a new approach to safety that's being taken on from um, – uh, a, on a national level called the Safe Systems Approach, which is just taking a more holistic uh, look at the approach to safety as we're moving forward with all different um, coalitions. Uh, there's also, of course, as we've talked about, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or IJA, um, with a lot of new funding opportunities, including the RAISE grant that we just discussed, um, the Safe Streets and Roads for All, um, Re reconnecting communities. I mean, there's countless different grant opportunities or new funding opportunities uh, to focus on improving safety. Um, and last but not least, I think and really one of the most important is that we keep continuing to hear from our communities and you all, our member governments, um, that this is a priority and something that we want to continue to update and improve on. And so um, we feel like that there's just kind of this big coalescence of all of these different things, it brings us to the perfect time to uh, take a look at the plan and see where we can maybe um, make some new revisions that are more in tune with where we're at um, with the state of um, things today. So just to remind you guys a little bit about what is the uh, current taking action on Regional Vision Zero plan, broken down into seven chapters. Um, as you can see here, I'm not going to 
read them all out to you, but um, really some of the most important ones are Vision Zero Principles and then the toolkit, which has our high injury network. Um, and then really the big uh, guts of it comes down to the implementation plan, chapter six there. Um, and so this work was done a handful of years ago. You know, we're already looking at, we're almost into March of 2023, but this was adopted um, from the board in June of 2022. So we're, we're coming up on three years now. It's definitely time to, to take a relook at um, what we've got going on here. And so, like I said, chapter six is where there's a lot of the meat of this plan and where we think um, we're gonna be focusing most of our update efforts. Um, and then additionally, we also want to create a um, companion resource of a new story map. Um, you know, Dr. Cog has taken on this, uh, these new efforts with our GIS team to um, explore creating more story maps as a resource for the region. And we've found them to be extremely um, helpful for folks. And so this is another um, topic, Vision Zero, that we're going to be uh, exploring that with that team to create um, another hopefully really useful tool for you all to continue to use. So again, that chapter six that I was speaking about, um, the implementation plan, this is what it currently is structured as within our action plan. Um, it's broken down into our objectives. We've got six of those. And then there's action initiatives and then sub actions within that. And then we have a kind of loose uh, identification of responsibility. And then this action year that we identified, which again, since this was done in 2020, um, we are really already up on the, the 2023 was the latest year that we planned for when we were doing this implementation plan. Um, and then last but not least, we, we do mention a couple of performance measures here at the um, listed on the page, but honestly, I just don't feel like the, the format even looking at this really makes a lot of sense when you're trying to create basically a, a plan of how to um, you know approach safety uh, for all these different um, from all these different strategic approaches. And so what, what, one, one of the many things, things that we'll be doing as we look at um, implementing a new update to this is just the actual format of this, um, looking at having more breakdown of the responsibility of these actions, you know, helping to identify, is it a Dr. Cog led effort? Is this an effort that's led by the local um, member governments or is it led by a coalition of folks? And um, having more, uh, concrete performance measures is also a big key priority for us because you can't measure um, how well we're doing or, or not doing if we don't have those performance measures identified. So uh, the other thing that I mentioned that we'll be creating, if this isn't an update, this is a completely new resource, is the Vision Zero Story Map. And so um, this will be, again, a companion resource for the action plan. Uh, it will explore expanding on our high injury network, uh, as well as the critical corridors. We might, we also want to look at um, exploring into our crash behaviors and um, profiles that are in the, in the region. And we will be splitting, we will be getting the scoping of this work just, uh, I mean, wow, it's March this week. So we were going to, we're going to be starting working with our RPD team to uh, scoping out this project later this month. And again, if you're not familiar with what a story map is, this is our, an example screenshot of our complete street story map that the RPD team helped us put together. Um, it's really just kind of inter an interactive resource that has both text and mapping and a lot of other types of ways for you to just um, access data that we can provide to you all um, as, as, again, a tool. And then um, last but not least, the biggest reason why I think we're kind of uh, bringing this to you today is the work that we're doing here can only be done with your help. Like this is a collaboration is extremely critical to this work. Um, and so we have the Regional Vision Zero work group that meets once a month and coming up this next March will be our first working group that is gonna actually truly take on that name. And we're gonna use that time as, to workshop and figure out um, you know, what is working, what's not working with the plan and how to move forward on um, identifying what are the specific things that need updating, refreshing, um, new, new additions to the plan. Um, all of that is going to take place within these regional Vision Zero work group meetings that happen monthly. So if you participate in them or you know that somebody from your uh, member government participates in them, please encourage them to uh, continue to participate in them as we move forward because that I know that currently in the, in the past we've used them a lot of times as information sharing um, sessions, but this 
this next six months or so is really going to be imperative to um, if you want your your thoughts and your visions for how safety in the region are going to be explored, I implore you to uh, make sure you have participants in that um, group meet those monthly group meetings. And again, those are the second Tuesday of the month from 10 to 11 a.m. And if you're not um, already on that invite, please reach out to me. Uh, my information should be on the packet here, but um, if you do not already, if you don't have it, I'm happy to send you that invite. And then, last but not least, here's our um, timelines as we are here right now um, at the February TAC. We are going to be getting those workshops next month, like I mentioned, hoping to bring you guys an updated work to this back in November, and then finally do a publish or publish that update work in December of this year. So the the ultimate plan is to have all of this done before the end of this calendar year. And that Vision Zero story map is also, again, pretty short work. We're going to have that um, scoping starting in, I, I know I mentioned March, but April, March is sort of when we have on the timeline. We've given ourselves two months to figure that out because it's once you figure it out, all it, it's not a lot of work to actually implement it um, with our team. And then we have um, hope to have it approved by our internal teams and then published in early of next year. And I'm just going to end again with the statement or the sentiment that Vision Zero is possible. Um, I know it can seem like a lot, but um, I appreciate that we all are here um, working together to collaborate on such an important issue. And um, yeah, I'm here to take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Ms. Kleinfelter. Any questions from the TAC? Mr. Pilgrim? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Emily, um, last month you, you gave us an update on, um, I don't remember the name of the, the update. It was Vision Zero and comparison to the national standards or the, the criteria. Yeah. Are you referring to our federal performance measures that we yep. did last month? There you go. Yes. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's known as PM1 safety. It just rolls right off the tongue. Okay. PM1 safety. So, Emily, will the work group uh, be using those kinds of guidelines to help their work? They will definitely be something that is taken into account as we do our work, but I think we also have our regional, you know, goals, and um, we will be probably working a lot more within the CDOT and Dr. Cog framework of, of those um, goals. Does that make sense? Well, it does, but I, I would think that they would all be sort of compatible. They are, across absolutely. The board. Yeah, Rick and everyone, I'd actually flip that a little bit. I think um, when we set our PM1 safety targets, as they're known, um, we actually base it on this work. We base it on MetroVision. We base it on the fact, as you'll recall last month, Looking at that trend line of um, the tentative sort of targets we've set, the timeline targets we've set for reaching zero, 2040 for fatalities, 2045 for serious injuries, you recall last month we talked about annualizing a trend line based on that to figure out our very short-term PM1 performance targets. So I think ultimately the work we talked about last month really is based on this work, not the other way around. Okay. I, I, this approach makes more sense to me that it... And, and then we we compare the results and report those. Okay, thank you. Ms. Michael-Best. Thank you, this is exciting work. Thanks for sharing the plan. Just curious, and you may not know yet, and that's okay, but looking at the story map, the crash behaviors and profiles, so if you're producing the map in 2024, is it gonna be a rear view mirror look particularly for crash behaviors, we're seeing a lot of different types of behaviors with crashes. So will we be looking hindsight? And what kind of a window of time do you know are you looking at? Or are you going to be looking, trying to look kind of ahead to prevent what we saw in the rearview mirror? Well, you were correct that I don't know the answer to your question just yet. But I think that's a great thing to keep in mind as we are putting forward that scoping to understand that we are going to be looking and analyzing previous data, but how can we also take a look at it and be, um, you know, strategizing for the future? Um, we are currently in a, in a bit of a rock and a hard place with our data because um, we would love to be doing a lot more data analysis, but just due to issues with getting it um, timely enough, we don't have our 
most current data, you know, from 2022 to be working with. Um, so when we're doing those crash profiles or behavior profiles, unfortunately, you know, we can only control so much of that. And so we would love to yeah, analyze it to at least have a better understanding of what we're seeing in the region. But we, if we don't have the data to be working with, then we can only do so much with that. That said, Emily, can I put a little bit of a positive spin on your answer? I think that's all true, and, and we, we all suffer from that data lag. I know CDOT does as well. And while the crash data, of course, can jump around a little bit from year to year, we're also looking, and the plan is structured to kind of look longer term in terms of some of those behavior profiles, the countermeasures. In our original plan, we actually did an analysis by major land use type. So we're looking at some of those more big picture holistic things where we think we can draw out over time some trends, some patterns, some statistics, and we want the story map to kind of focus on that as well. But Jessica, your point is well taken to the extent that we can keep getting updated data and refining those, that's absolutely important as well. Mr. Schmidt. You know, I echo Jessica's comments. I think this is a really important document to keep working live, right? So much changes in one to two years. So keeping it going, I think is critical. One question, you know, we, you talked about stakeholder responsibilities. And I know a lot of times you have like six people listed or we all do that. We have everyone. It, it, is there any interest in sort of assigning one lead agency in some of those with then support agencies? Because I think sometimes when we have, we all do that. If you list all your kids, you know, if you list everybody, everyone's like, oh, good, someone else has it. So I guess that's just something to think about as you move forward. So. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. And we will definitely take it into account. Ms. Hilton. Thank you. I'll uh, echo previous comments that it's exciting to see this coming forward and expanding. Um, I'm sure Dr. Cog and others in the room are aware CDOT's uh, going through its advancing transportation safety program update. And uh, I'm on the steering committee. I think others in this room are as well. And then there's a couple of working groups underneath that. And I believe by uh, the end of March, maybe even sometime mid-March, that CDOT will be coming for, or not CDOT, but like the state agencies will be coming forward with their specific goals and strategies for 2023. And I just want to mention that because I've been really uh, excited to see how um, forward thinking some of them are. Um, so I just want to encourage coordination with that because uh, what works in Denver Metro hopefully can uh, impact statewide. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Any additional questions or comments? Well, thank you for that update on this really important Metro Vision priority. Thank you. We'll move on to um, item number eight, and this is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 2023 Mitigation Action Plan Annual Report Overview, Attachment F in your report, and I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieker, Manager of Multimodal Transportation Planning. All righty. Thank you all very much. So. Um, as most of you will recall, you all can hear me, right? Okay. As most of you will recall, we spent a good deal of last year um, updating and revising the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to respond to and address the state greenhouse gas planning standard, um, as it was known. One of the elements of that was to prepare a mitigation action plan, which we spent a lot of time on together, and that triggered a requirement that we need to do annual reporting associated with our mitigation action plan. So as we've gotten into our first annual report, wanted to kind of give you an overview of that. So this is a slide that most of you have seen many times, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but it is a reminder of our, what I call our layer cake approach um, to the set of thematic strategies and things that we needed to do in our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan to comply with the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, each of these actually is a collection of sort of strategies, projects, specific things we did. But if you look at the lower right, you notice the mitigation action plan at the bottom, and that's the way that it was structured in the rule. You use a mitigation action plan if after doing everything else, you still have that little bit of a gap to close in order to meet the reduction levels in the rule, and that's exactly what we had to do. So speaking of those reduction levels in the rule, again, you all have seen this quite a bit, but just as a quick reorientation, this comes directly from the greenhouse gas planning standard. We're looking at million metric tons. Um, we are looking at the um, uh, results of the work that we did last year in terms of our ability to comply um, with the reduction level set in the rule. So as a reminder, what this table specifically is showing is just the breakdown of those different strategies. We kind of collapsed them together. All the work that we did with the uh, regional transportation plan with our modeling, um, the things that went into that. 
Um, as you recall, we talked a lot about additional programmatic investments in the plan. That was part of our strategy to comply with the rule. And then the mitigation action plan um, was, the, again, that last piece to sort of get us over the, the finish line to comply with the reduction levels. Those reduction levels are in red um, at the bottom, again, million metric tons. And as you can see, we did need the mitigation action plan for almost all of the analysis here that are required within the rule. We don't need it for 2025, but starting in 2030, we do need the mitigation action plan for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, and again, as a reminder on the mitigation action plan background, we talked a lot about this last summer. It is needed as that last step to close the remaining reduction level gap. It will document our regions or the plan itself already documented. The report will also document our region's approach to using mitigation measures to comply with the rule. It reports and analyzes those mitigation measures at the regional level. This is very much a regional analysis in keeping with the regional transportation plan and the regional focus of the greenhouse gas planning standard itself. However, that said, we anticipated at the time when we put this together that we think that implementation will be anticipated in a small fraction of the region in strategic and applicable geographies. And what we mean by that is that we'll get to the actual mitigation measures in a second, but we recognize when we put this together, not all mitigation measures are going to be applied equally everywhere by everyone at every time, right? These are very tailored strategies. They probably make sense, hopefully, in certain areas, but not in other areas and certainly not broadly across the region. So while the focus of reporting and analysis is at the regional level, the implementation will be at more the micro level. And then finally, uh, we have ample opportunity to implement successfully over time to help us achieve, achieve compliance. Again, we don't need the mitigation measures until 2030, so we have now seven years to kind of do this analysis, do the annual reporting, take a look at implementation progress over time and adjust as we go um, that's part of the point of the way the rule is structured. So a reminder in terms of the mitigation measures themselves, and I'll show them on the next slide, but in the big picture, they are policy-based and not project-based, and that's actually pretty important. Uh, for some other um, jurisdictions who had to comply with the rules, such as CDOT, for example, uh, we do have some similarities between our mitigation measures and our mitigation action plan, but we also have some key differences. CDOT is actually using, in part, some projects or services, some kind of concrete things um, as part of their mitigation measures. We were able to account for project-based things in our transportation plan, in our modeling, in our technical analysis. So we have the tools um, to account for a, a broad swath of multimodal transportation investments, major projects, programmatic investments, other things that we could capture in other ways. So for us, our mitigation action plan sort of became what's left over on the checklist of possible things that you can include in a mitigation action plan. Those things are policy-based. They're land use oriented, they're policy oriented, they're actions that local governments would take. They are not projects per se. Um, again, measured regionally, implemented locally. Mitigation measures, as we talked about quite a bit last summer, and I wanna emphasize again to you all at local governments, they are voluntary and they were not required to implement in any specific location at any specific time or by any specific jurisdiction. They are completely voluntary at the local government level. The requirement is on us as the MPO, as Dr. Cog, to have a mitigation action plan and to report on the region's efforts over time to implement mitigation measures. As I've said, they can be adjusted over time based on implementation status. Um, but as I've, as I've led with, annual reporting is required based on the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, if you have a mitigation action plan, you have to do an annual mitigation action plan report, and that is due um, by transmittal to the Transportation Commission by April 1st of each year. So it does not require board adoption. We will not be bringing this to you for recommended approval. It is administrative staff function, but we are required to submit it to the Transportation Commission each April. So in terms of the mitigation measures, as a reminder, what's actually in our mitigation action plan, we had several mitigation measures. One deals with increasing residential densities. And for each of these, the planning standard required that we estimated the reduction levels obviously associated with each mitigation measure, because as you saw before, it became part of the overall sort of layer cake of our uh, compliance strategies. So here, this is the only time you'll see actual metric tons, not million metric tons. Next one was increasing job density. Again, both of these are in locations that make sense um, to be able to implement these kind of measures. 
mixed use transit oriented development. Um, again, obviously you can, you can see that land use transportation connection of where that makes sense. Reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements. Um, again, that's not a universal strategy, um, but there are strategic locations we think in the region where that makes sense. And, and none of these are new. And that was part of the point of mitigation action plan. As a region, we have been doing these things um, in varying, varying degrees for a very long time. We wanted to build on that good planning that the region's already been doing and capture that as part of our mitigation action plan. And then finally, we've talked a lot about uh, complete streets here. Um, Emily just touched on this earlier, I think. Uh, we have our regional complete streets toolkit. Several of you have adopted um, local um, complete street standards. So we actually made that part of the mitigation action plan if more jurisdictions adopted local complete street standards and applied those standards to future projects, particularly locally funded projects within the plan. That was part of our mitigation action plan as well. So in terms of the mitigation action plan annual report that's required by the greenhouse gas planning standard, there are some requirements. Um, these are listed here. I'll just briefly touch on them. For each mitigation measure, so as you saw, we have several mitigation measures in our mitigation action plan. So for each of our mitigation measures, we need to talk about what we think the implementation time frame is for each of these measures, the current status, and I will, I will warn you, you know, for six months, <laughs> six months removed from adopting the mitigation action plan, there's not going to be a lot to say about current status, but we're starting to think through, and I'll touch on this in the next slide, how do we start talking about that over time? But implementation time frame status of each measure, uh, for those that are in progress or completed, we won't have any of those yet, but if we did, quantification of the annual benefit associated with those mitigation measures once completed. And then for those that might be delayed, canceled, or substituted, and remember I said we can adjust over time, so this isn't a first year thing, but over time, an explanation of why and how those measures or their equivalent will be achieved. So if we're gonna change our strategy, we have to talk about that in the reporting as well. And then finally, this is important for measures located in a disproportionately impacted community, as was defined in State Senate Bill 260, that are delayed, canceled, or substituted, an explanation of why and how those measures or their equivalent will still be achieved in those disproportionately impacted communities. So to be clear, um, given the nature of our mitigation action plan measures, our measures are not project-based and they're not location-based. This requirement does not at this time directly apply to us. However, the concept of equity and the theme of equity is very important in this work and we will be addressing equity as best we can in terms of the mitigation action plan report, just as we did in the mitigation action plan itself. So finally, just want to end as, as us as staff have kind of gotten into this and we've started thinking through, um, putting this together, we're working on a draft. Just wanted to share just some of the key issues, questions, challenges, things that we're struggling with and we're thinking about as we put this together. So first is how do we track mitigation measures? Not as easy as it sounds. Remember with these measures being local government actions around rezoning, redevelopment, parking policy, transit oriented development, are we tracking every sort of uh, quasi-judicial action that a local government takes amongst our 56 local governments? Are we gonna hound you for every rezoning that you're, you've done since October 1st, right? That's potentially very data, staff, financial, and other resource intensive. So we're trying to think about how do we get our arms around that? How do we track that and, and work on that in a very efficient way? What does adequate progress look like? Um, particularly at the front end of this, when we're six months removed from adopting the plan, that's really hard. But even a couple of years into it, well, how do you define adequate progress? Is it a trend line? Um, an even trend line between now and 2030? Is it peaks and valleys? Do we know that some things are gonna happen later and we account for that and we backwards annualize that? Do we do that in some other way, right? That's just you know something we're thinking through. How do we track adequate progress? How do we define a measurement baseline and change over time? Some of that is defined in the greenhouse gas planning standard, but some of it is a little bit open to interpretation. Does it start on October 1st? Does it start with the assumptions in our adopted 2050 regional transportation plan? Does it start with our best data set that we had as of October 1st? Like how do you, how do you define that baseline? What's your point of departure? How do you define that change over time? Those are all things that we're working through. And then finally in this bucket, and, and I could go on much longer, but another key point is policy changes. Remember that's what we're talking about for these mitigation measures doesn't directly equate to development activity. The way the mitigation measures are structured in the greenhouse gas planning standard and they're implemented through CDOT's policy directive 1610, these policy oriented measures around redevelopment, job density, those sorts of things are about the action that the local government takes. If you as a local government rezone 
or do something with parking requirements or transit oriented development or whatever it is, it's that policy action that you take as a local government that we're trying to capture. That's different, as you all know, than development activity, right? Um, one sort of follows the other, one sort of sets up the framework for the other. Um, but it turns out tracking local government policy actions is actually a pretty hard thing to do. It's actually easier to track development over time. So part of what we're trying to think through and getting our arms around this is how can we sort of bring those things together so that we're meeting the intent of the rule and the policy directive, but able to track it in a way that actually makes sense and something that we can report on over time. The other sort of aspect besides sort of the tracking and the technical data is the other aspect of the rule is the local government outreach and support um, that we'll provide to you. That's part of why I'm presenting today. I never want to miss an opportunity to get in front of you all as local governments to remind you about the mitigation action plan, the importance of the plan, the fact that we care about these actions that you take, especially if you took them after October 1st of 2022. But at the same time, we committed in the mitigation action plan that we would provide data, information, other supports to you all for those of you that were interested and wanted to work with us specifically over time as you take some of these actions. So what about ongoing communication about needed information? How do we communicate with you? How do we keep track with you? How do you reach out to us? What resources and supports do you as interested local governments need from Dr. Cog? So those are things that we wanna work through together with you. And then finally, I wanna end with this key point. The Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard is very important. It's some groundbreaking work nationally. We're on the front edge of this, um, the MPOs and CDOT in this state. And it's important and we wanna quote unquote check that box, but it's not just about meeting the greenhouse gas planning standard. It's about doing good planning in this region and across the state. That's how we structured our greenhouse gas transportation report in the plan last year. That's how we structured the mitigation action plan. And as we're working on this first annual report, that's something that we want to keep in mind. We're not just doing all this stuff or generating this data so that we can check a box on the greenhouse gas planning standard. We're talking as a region and actually at the state legislature about housing policy, transportation land use connection, transit oriented development. We want to do things that actually leverage the good planning work that you're doing, that we're doing, and we're doing together as a state and leverage some of these other efforts and not just look at this in a silo. So that's been our sort of coordinated planning approach to this. So that is your drink from a fire hydrant, but I wanted to give you that overview. I wanted to remind you that's out there um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rager. Do we have any questions or comments? Mr. Weimer? A couple for you. Once you get this draft, yes, at, at some point we will do that, yes. Yep. Second, so you touched on this a little bit, but there's legislation increases. How does that, have you started talking about that, implications of transportation plan and what that means? Yeah, I'm going to start an answer and then I'm going to lean on Ron to help me out, but it's not going to affect anything I've just presented on in the sense that we still have the requirement to do our first mitigation action plan for 2023 by April 1st. We're proceeding on that course. We're gonna get that report done and go from there. But in the future, in terms of our kind of planning efforts, the greenhouse gas planning standard and whatnot, I will defer to Ron to maybe speak to that if you'd like to. Thank you. Um, so we don't know is the quick answer. The longer answer is uh, the, board of, the board of directors did take a position on that bill. Um, Senate bill um, to seek amendments to the bill. I think the the principal issues that were discussed and raised by the board were sort of challenges with introducing new interim analysis years or target years in statutory targets for greenhouse gas reductions um, and lowering the 2050 target to 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, reaching zero greenhouse gas emissions from all sources by 2050, um, which um, I think is a, a practical. To, uh, to eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions across all sources, just impractical. And in some ways dilutes 
sort of the transportation efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through transportation planning, because the only way truly you can achieve grow greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector is to convert all vehicles to electric vehicles. And at that point, once you've converted the fleet to 100% electric vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles, there's no need to further manage travel or traffic or reduce BMT because it doesn't matter how many cars are out there. None of them are creating greenhouse gas emissions. So the board took a position to seek amendments to the bill. Um, from a practical standpoint, in terms of the rule, it's unclear. There is, there's a statutory pass between the targets to the CDOT rulemaking that created the greenhouse. But there were some interim steps that happened. That's the statewide uh, greenhouse gas reduction roadmap that presumably if the state adopts new reduction targets, the roadmap would have to be adjusted to distribute those reductions across the various sectors that generate greenhouse gas emissions. And then CDOT presumably because Senate Bill 260 created statutory language requiring CDOT to adopt rules to achieve greenhouse gas reductions to achieve the targets that are adopted in the statute that are being proposed, that are proposed to be amended. So eventually it may get to revising the rule, but as Jacob correctly said, it's not immediate and we don't know exactly how that would happen, what that process would be. And I guess my third even more obscure because we haven't seen any bills yet. It really touches on the use by right legislation functions. Potentially come out of this. Is that correct? That's correct. So more unknowns. Any additional questions, comments, feedback? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will move on to the next item, which is. Item nine, TAC Agenda Topic Survey. Again, Jacob Rieger. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're gonna set up a Mentimeter survey, but in addition to rearranging tables, we have been thinking ahead. Um, as we've presented to you, we're working on our new Unified Planning Work Program. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, you all took action recommendation last fall on our revised committee guidelines, which will add 10 members to the Transportation Advisory Committee. So all of that and more has kind of just prompted us to be a little bit forward-looking thinking ahead in terms of um, you know, the TAC, the types of things that we bring to you. Uh, we bring a lot of information to you. We know these meetings are long. We're not looking to make them longer, but we do just kind of want to have a check-in in terms of topics that you're interested in, things you'd like us to present to you, uh, different ideas of things, things that you're working on that you'd like to present to us. So this is the beginning of a conversation that we'll have over time, um, but we want to do a quick mentee survey with you to just kind of get some input um, around things you're interested in hearing from us at future TAC meetings and things you might be interested um, in presenting to us um, at TAC over time. So I'm going to ask my colleague, Nora Kern, to walk us through a mentee survey. All right. Well, I see some of you have already logged in, but if you haven't used Menti recently, um, if you there's two ways, or the main way to participate is to use it on your phone. You can either scan that QR code and it should bring you directly to the correct one, or you can go to menti.com and enter this code here. So, looks like we've got most folks uh, logged in. Um, the this code will stay on the screen, so if you're need a second, it should stay on the screen at the bottom. So our first question um, is, as Jacob said, we are thinking about adding, potentially adding periodic educational and or informational sessions to TAC meetings. So there's a couple options here, but we're curious what type of sessions are of most interest to you. You can pick multiple options or you can pick a single one if there's one that is especially important. But some of the options here are educational sessions on general multimodal transportation topics, sessions on key regional issues related to transportation, updates on federal and or state policy efforts that may be impacting the region, 
Um, updates from TAC members on the implementation status for major projects in their jurisdictions, uh, and then guest speakers from other regions or other organizations in the region. So if any of those are of special importance, you can go ahead and add those. And I can show the results. All right, this is really helpful just to, again, as we kind of think over the coming years, which ones we might want to prioritize our, our planning. All right, so our next question, um, are there any topics or themes kind of diving a little bit more specifically that you would like to learn about at TAC meetings? Um, again, you can select multiple options, the ones we have up here, uh, parking policy, affordable housing and transportation, transit-oriented development, vision zero, connected autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, signal op optimization, uh, funding opportunities, and travel demand management. And there will be a fill in the blank on the next slide. So if there's a topic that you're thinking of that's not listed, just hold on to that for a few moments. Perfect, we're seeing some trends here, so that's good. All of the above, that's great also. <laughs> we'll just, we'll have three hour meetings for the next year and we should cover it all. <laughs> All right, it looks like about everyone's pretty pretty evenly spread, so I guess that's good, but affordable housing seems to be uh, in the lead. So this one is, um, again, if there's any topics that weren't listed that you think would be really useful to learn about, to add, a, add to TAC agendas, um, topics, themes, or even if there's a speaker in particular you, you wanna toss out there, feel free to do that. So yeah, we'll just see some of these suggestions come up. If you can't think of anything on the spot and you want to follow up with us, feel, you know, we can definitely, you can come back to us um, after mulling it over for the next little bit. I'll just give this a minute. Great ideas though, appreciate all of the suggestions. All right, and again, if, uh, let's give it another 30 seconds, but don't feel the rush if you wanna think about it for a little bit and get back to us, that's perfectly fine. Fixing the Broncos, uh, we'll definitely make sure to add that one. I'm sure we'll find an excellent speaker to uh, speak to that, that topic. Great. All right, and then I think a couple more coming in, busting plans, future of transit ridership. I think we're all curious about that one. <laughs> um, great, we'll go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so this is, we, we've been contemplating whether or not we wanna add kind of uh, updates from TAC members. So our first question is, are you in, in the next year or so, is your jurisdiction working on any corridor plans? master plans or actions related to the RTP greenhouse gas mitigation action plan that Jacob just gave an update on that you think you will be interested or would be interested in presenting on in the coming year. So this one's another one. If things come up after the meeting, you can certainly be in touch with us, but I think there's a short form that you should be seeing on your phone that you could fill in if you, if you know that there's gonna be something happening in your jurisdiction that um, is of relevance for the entire region. All right, and if you don't have any anything at the moment, you can just hit submit and it should let you go to the next slide. Mitigation action plan going once, going <laughs> twice. We can do it. Who, who's updating their park, parking policy? Let's... All right. Looks like most folks have filled that out. And then kind of even more broadly, are there any other major projects, plans, or initiatives that aren't corridor plans, master plans, or mitigation action um, measure actions that you think your jurisdiction might be doing? Any of the above? Opportunity for you to show off to your peers. Yep. 
And again, um, yeah, well, this this will be over the next year. So if, if something comes up in six months that you think is really important, um, this isn't your only opportunity to give input. So I think this is our last question. So thanks for the input, short and sweet. Uh, but this will be helpful kind of over the coming months. And uh, if things come up, feel free to reach out and let us know. So with that, back to Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thanks for that survey. And we'll move on to administrative items. Item number 10, uh, Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group update. Uh, Rachel Holtine, do you have an update for us today? Yeah, I do. Car Carson, unfortunately, isn't able to attend today, but he did send me an update to share with the group. Uh, and it is four pages long. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so he writes, uh, earlier this month, the AMP Working Group met to hear an informational briefing about curb management from the city of Oakland and hear about CDOT's electrification efforts from Mike King. The group also held election of officers for 2023 and discussed the meeting format for the year. Uh, uh, I would direct any specific questions to Dr. Cog's staff, Emily Lindsay or uh, Kaylee Fallon. Thank you. And uh, Jacob, do you have an update for us? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. A little bit of a sad update from a Dr. Cog perspective, but I want to say congratulations to Matthew Helfan, our senior transit planner. Um, his last day with us is this Friday. Um, we're going to miss him very much. He leaves huge shoes to fill, um, but he's been our senior transit planner for almost a decade um, here at Dr. Cog um, and has been involved in just really a lot of really tremendous things that we've worked on in the transit and freight arena uh, and other things over the last decade. So we're really going to miss him, but I wanted to say congratulations to him. Um, thank him for his service to Dr. Cog. Wish him well um, in his next steps. And if you know anyone who wants to be a senior transit planner, Dr. Cog, the position will be open soon. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Congratulations, and we'll all miss you. Uh, any other updates from members? I don't see any more updates, so I will adjourn the meeting. Uh, the next TAC meeting is March 27, 2023. We are now adjourned at 247. Thank you.